Hi, welcome back to my channel. This is the second episode of chapter 3. But then before I begin, again, please, give, please have a look again at the tablet that I've got in my hands, which shows well the important topics that we came across in the last episode. And see whether, well, you can still remember many of these. And if you do not, then I suggest, well, you revise what we learned last time before carrying on. So please have a look at these. If you're ready, let's begin. In this episode, we carry on by looking at the last four learning outcomes, that is five, six, seven, and eight. Yeah, for number five, um, to assess the impact in corporate and project finance of environmental issues, firstly, uh, we need to analyze quantitative, quantitative, and qualitative environmental factors and then make a judgment on materiality. Well, because well, there are so many of these factors and then uh, some may be material and some may be not. So we need to uh, make a judgment to determine um, which are going to cause more problem or cause more financial impact than the others. And notably, uh, materiality is highly influenced by the industry or sector of the company, as well as its country and jurisdictions. And apart from the private sector or companies, surely governments have a role in achieving climate targets. And they allocate resources and mobilize investments. And they may also self say uh, invest in vehicles or other entities like say green infrastructure funds, specialized banks and funding platforms. In terms of international initiative, uh, there are so-called skin sinky principles signed by finance ministers around the world, uh, which encourages signatories to take climate change into account in macroeconomic policy, fiscal planning, budgeting, public investment management, and procurement practices. For asset management sector, asset managers are increasingly focused on the development of standardized frameworks and data points to be able to assess climate and environmental risks. Yeah, so it's pretty much well. Um, as a manager, they want a consistent way to assess those uh, you know, those issues. Uh, the SASB, the Sustainability and Accounting Standards Board, which is now under RSSB or so called International Sustainability Centers Board, um, has help asset managers by providing an interactive proposal tool that identifies and compares disclosure topics across different industries and sectors. And uh, this summarize in a so-called materiality map yeah, that we are going to revisit in chapter seven. Right, learning article number six. Um, this to identify approaches to environmental analysis, which will, or probably speaking, uh, we need to understand the, environment, the environmental factors um, and how such risks may evolve over time, and then translate these risk factors in the quantitative measures of financial risks. And there are different levels of uh, doing this analysis. But the lowest level would be at the company project level. Some companies that may use a scoring system to score different companies. Uh, based on external data, for example, uh, external ESG data providers and internal analysis, say, from uh, in-house analysts. 
and then we need to uh, determine materiality of, of this risk and how they may affect key efficiency and profitability ratio so um, to allow for such risk uh, there will be certain adjustment for example say um, border level adjustment like say adjusting P ratio or say if we can actually uh, identify maybe cost impact then or, or other say uh, capex impact then we adjust directly to uh, corresponding items in the financial statements and we look at the environmental uh, uh, with at the sector level and obviously some sectors have high, high, high exposure to environmental risk or physical risk from natural disasters then for these sectors um, we may use a higher environmental risk premium or hard discount rate in discounting future profit or maybe dividends uh, country level well surely there are differences in regulation emission targets and enforcement and notably uh, environmental risk can be very relevant to government bonds say there may be certain countries that are vulnerable to say uh, 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 flooding or natural disasters and sometimes they may be material enough so that will they actually affect the repayment ability of the countries and we also look at uh, the risk at the market level Not, noting that environmental risk can create adverse systemic impact but then um, the problem is that uh, we know that uh, certain environment, environmental risk creates adverse systemic impact but then it's not practical to actually mitigate this kind of risk completely so called well this risk may be unhatchable i.e. investors intend to shift away from high common sector say we find that there are just not enough available alternatives to buy right the first the next few slides are very important and there is a lot of examinable material so please pay plenty of attention to the next few slides right this slide is about carbon footprinting so uh, roughly speaking it is a measurement of carbon emission and intensity and then uh, what's meant by carbon emissions according to uh, greenhouse gas protocol standards there are three different types uh, scope 1, 2 and 3 um, scope 1 is the measure of direct greenhouse gas emissions uh, occurring from the sources that are controlled or owned by an organization say fuel combustion in furnaces or company vehicles uh, scope 2 and 3 are indirect and for scope 2 um, that's about emissions uh, from uh, with the purchase of electricity and then scope 3 comprises all the other indirect emissions other than scope 2 and as you can see uh, this is like exhaustive list but again you can recognize that uh, the scope can be extremely wide for example say even employees commuting can add to a scope 3 emission so be very careful And then say for uh, financial firms, like say uh, banks or insurance companies, they will not uh, produce plenty of scope one and two in emission. But then, uh, depending on, on their investment or loan book, uh, scope three emissions can be material. Right, carbon footprinting formulas. Well, please remember these two formulas total carbon emissions and weighted average carbon intensity or also called WACI say total carbon emissions uh, to sum up it's pretty much the investor share um, of an investing company's um, greenhouse gas emissions as a percentage 
of the issuer's market capitalization. So uh, if it is uh, equity shares, then it's kind of more uh, uh, trivial. But then uh, if it's in bonds, then for capitalization, well, we will add back uh, the, the amount for outstanding bonds into the uh, denominator. And then wacky, well, weighted average carbon intensity. So, well, the first part formula is pretty much, well, the weighted average factor. And then the, the other is the e source carbon uh, intensity. So it's the e source uh, greenhouse gas emissions divided by, the, by its revenue. And you may note that I have circled scope 1 and 2. That means that in both of these formulas, scope 3 is not included. So be extremely careful. We well, do not include uh, scope 3 in these two formulas. Do not. Okay. Uh, we've got this formula. So can I truly figure out uh, the carbon footprint of companies very uh, precisely? The answer is unfortunately no. For example, uh, normally um, for unlisted or private assets, there's no disclosure at all. And then very often companies will only disclose scope 1 and 2 emissions and then not so much about uh, scope 3. Double counting. Well, like a producer, uh, we have a certain amount of st uh, scope 1 emission. And then a company buying goods from that producer. Uh, the purchase of goods will add to the, 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 the purchasing company's uh, SOP 3 emission. But then if we include SOP 1, 2 and 3 for both of these companies, then there will be double counting. And surely, well, well like a lot of uh, problems with data, then there will be inconsistency in the data as a result, use the use of different estimation methodologies. And physical impacts of carbon change can uh, create a lot of uh, adverse impact, but then carbon footprinting may not be able to uh, take that into account explicitly. Right, there are other ways to measure carbon footprint. Or actually, well, the kind of trajectory of common of common footprint. Um, the first one will be so-called uh, net zero or science-based targets, and there is some kind of standardization via the science-based target initiative (SBTI). Uh, SBTI provides independent certification of the strength of the company's targets, and SBTI has produced guidance for sectors like power, apparel, and footwear, and also ICT. Yeah, the others include um, the emission trajectories, like the pathway towards net zero, uh, temperature alignment, so it's to compare uh, the development and carbon profile of companies on say sector portfolios against a benchmark global temperature. And then, well, we may also measure the green capital expenditures, revenues, and research and development of a company. Natural capital approach. Um, it is to identify, measure, value, and prioritize companies' impacts and dependencies on biodiversity and the ecosystem. And there's a so-called natural capital protocol. Um, which provides a decision making framework to identify, measure, and value uh, the impacts and dependencies on natural capital. And then the TMNFT Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosures uh, releases nature related risk management framework for market consultation. And then lastly, uh, there is so, this so-called climate scenario analysis, which is for looking at assessment of risks and opportunities. And according to TCFD, it recommends that companies and financial institutions 
describe the resilience of the organization strategy. Taking into consideration scenarios including two degree Celsius or lower scenario. And then the IIGCC Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change has published a practical investor's guide on climate scenario analysis. Okay, well, um, I'm not talking anything about uh, the income number seven. Well, because well, if you go to the notes, uh, it's a case study. So please go to the notes and study a case study. Thank you. My last one. Um, explain how companies and the investment share industry can benefit from opportunities related to climate change and environmental issues, circular economy, clean and te tech innovation, green and ESG related products and the blue economy. Um, so these are, are quite uh, self explanatory so I'm not going to spend time. So um, I think we should uh, pay more attention on uh, green and ESG related products because we're well, honestly uh, there's a lot of inconsistency in how they are defined so there's plenty of scope of greenwashing and to summarize they are easy in recognizing a product to be green and sustainable uh, like the eligibility of assets and criteria to meet the green ESU SDG SDG means the sustainability development goals related objectives use of proceeds uh, transparency reporting requirements and whether the issuer or borrower has a clean sustainability and ESG strategy. Above the green bonds, there are also successful bonds that are issued by high emission companies, say coal fired power plants, to finance their reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And then there are also green bond and green loan principles uh, established to promote the integrity of the green bond and green loan markets of highly blue economy. Uh, we actually came across this earlier. Uh, it means a su sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods and jobs, preserving the health of ocean ecosystems.